Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is the truth, and we do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for all the, the revelation you're bringing forth. We're taking hold of it, being doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to talk more about what Jesus Christ has accomplished in bringing forth the new covenant. And he has made all things new. Isaiah 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. God always tells us before he brings the new things forth. And that's exactly what he did in the Word of God, as we see in Isaiah chapter 43, in verse 18. He said, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God will make a way. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. You and I are formed for him. They shall show forth my praise. Remember, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're a purchased possession. You belong to him. And we are to walk in the ways of the Lord. This new thing that he said he was going to bring forth, he spoke in Jeremiah chapter 31. In verse 31, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He has come and he has made a new covenant. Everything that Jesus brought forth is new. It is all after the things of the Spirit. It is all after the realities of the things of God, not the types, not the shadows, not that which is pointing towards it. It is now a new day, a new covenant that he's brought into manifestation. And this covenant was made between the Father and the man Christ Jesus. We see in Matthew 26, down in verse 28, Jesus said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Not only did he come to take away the sins of the world, but also his blood was shed to bring forth the New Testament, a new covenant with God. We see this is declared over in Hebrews, in chapter 8, verse 6, speaking of what Jesus now is doing. Now that he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises, or enacted, laws enacted, this word means established, upon better promises. We now have a better covenant with better promises, and we have laws, which are laws of the Spirit that you and I are to walk after now. And of course, the way that we come into this covenant is by God bringing forth a change in us, which was absolutely of necessity in order to bring forth relationship with God. We see the problem with man is his he was under dominion of the devil. He was a spiritual father. And the answer was, as Ezekiel prophesied, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Everything is new. Now he gives us a new spirit. Now he gives us a new heart on the inside of us. Absolutely essential. And no other way that a person can come into relationship with God without getting a new spirit and a new heart. And how does this happen? It happens by birth. Just as we become a new person by physical birth, we become a new person spiritually by spiritual birth. In John chapter 3, we see in verse 3, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see or perceive the kingdom of God. In verse 5, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, that's physical birth, the water sack around the baby in the mother's womb. And of spirit, that's about the Holy Spirit surrounding us, and we are born by the Holy Spirit as we takes out the old spirit, puts in the new spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice, birth is what brings you in having a spirit, 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that's what happens to us. We get a brand new spirit on the inside of us when we are born again. That's why Jesus said, marvel not, I said unto you, you must be born again, which means from above. When we are born from above, we get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Everything becomes new. And this has produced a new creation of mankind on the earth that had died spiritually because of the fall of man and was under Satan's dominion as the spiritual father of mankind. Jesus became, came to bring forth this new creation, to make everything new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're brand new, a new creature or a new person on the inside of you. What is it? It's a new spirit. Old things are passed away, behold, all, all things have become new. Where? Not in your body, not in your mind, will, or emotions, but in spirit. we got a brand new spirit on the inside of us. And that's what counts. Everything else doesn't mean anything in so far as bringing a relationship. Galatians 6.15, he addressed this to the Galatian church that kept going back into the ways of the law. For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. It's irrelevant. But a new creature, that's what counts. Becoming a new creature because God brings forth new things through Jesus Christ to bring us into relationship with him, getting a brand new spirit on the inside of us. And we see that now, because of this, of course, Jesus was the one who was the firstborn from the dead, remember? Colossians 1.15 He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature or of all creation. There's a new creation that's come forth because man was dead, spiritually dead. Jesus accomplished the redemption. He brought the fees, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of every creature, of all creation. And that's what you and I come into that when we are born again, receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Everything is brand new. Hebrews chapter 12, he brought forth the church. And this church is a church of the firstborn. Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's the only church that he recognizes. And how do you get into it? Not by signing on the dotted line, not deciding to join some group. It's by being born again, receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. And remember, Jesus is the one, Colossians 1.18, who is now the founder of this. He's the cornerstone of the church. Says he's the head of the body, the church. The, body, the church is a body. You and I are living stones, a part of this body, as Jesus is the head of the body. He's the beginning, the firstborn from or out of the dead people. This is plural, we pointed out in the past in the Greek. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. So, now, we've seen a change. We've come into <coughs> relationship with God. How did we come into relationship with God? We got a brand new spirit. Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We have the spirit of his son, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, we've come into relationship and we're now a son. We're not a servant anymore. Verse 7, wherefore you're no more a servant who didn't have any rights or privileges, but now you're a son. And if a son, you're an heir of God through Christ. You have an inheritance now. The inheritance of all the promises of the New Testament that belong to us. We also have a new relationship with God now. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. We've been adopted in. Whereby you cry, Abba, Father. Daddy, Father. He now is your heavenly Father, and you're a child of God. The, a new creation that he's brought forth through new birth has now brought us into relationship with God as our heavenly Father. Satan was the spiritual father of mankind until Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, and now you and I have come into relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we see now in this relationship with Him, we are not sinners any longer. 
as we see in verse 2. Romans 6, 2, how, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're dead to sin. How did I get dead to sin? Because you are dead. The old you is dead. Romans 6, 7, for he that's dead is freed from sin. The old spirit is dead and gone, eliminated. The brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ has come into you, and that spirit does not have sin. You are freed from sin. Now you are to walk after the ways of the spirit. That means are you a sinner any longer? As Christians have been teaching forever that we're still sinners, we're always going to sin? No, you're not. Romans 6, 17, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine was delivered you, the gospel. Being then made free from sin, which we are, you became the servants of righteousness. You are a servant of righteousness. A relationship to God as a son, but still a servant. You are still a servant of something. And now because we come into relationship with him, we are a servant of righteousness to walk after the way of righteousness. Because everything that God has to deal with is always righteous. It's only the righteous that enter up in eternal life. Everything must be righteous. He is a righteous God. Jesus rules with a scepter of righteousness. Uh, everything has to be in line with his ways. We see in Matthew chapter 9, there's also a new, not only a new spirit that we get, but also there is a new manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The new wine is a type of the Holy Spirit. Neither do men put new wine. When it talks about new here, it's a different word in the Greek, not talking about a brand new one that never existed before because the Holy Spirit's always been here. This is talking about a new effect in our life, a new relationship is as far as the experience of the Holy Spirit in our life, new effect, new experience. It's what this word would refer to in the Greek. Neither do men put a new wine, which is the new experience of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you, into old bottles. The old bottle, bottle's a type of the Spirit. Well, that bottle's been eliminated. The bottles will break. The Holy Spirit who's holy can't come and dwell in a spirit that's under dominion of the devil. The wine runs out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine, type of the Holy Spirit, new, into new bottles. This is the different word for new which means something that never existed before, brand new. And that's what you and I have, a brand new spirit, because the bottle is a type of the spirit. So now, you now, you're a new bottle, a new spirit, and a new experience of the Holy Spirit, where now this new wine, the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell on the inside of us as we receive the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit is received after you're born again. Acts chapter 8, here's where Philip went down the city of Samaria, preached Christ to them. If one accord they gave heed to the things that Philip spake, they ended up getting born again, and they were baptized. When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Had they had the Holy Spirit yet? No. Verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God, they got born again. They sent unto them Peter and John. What did they come to do? Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. That's the new wine coming in to the new bottle. Had the Holy Spirit come into them yet? No, it says, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, showing the fact that they got born again on the inside of them. They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now is received subsequent to salvation. It is a promise and it is part of our inheritance. Ephesians 1.13 In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, your salvation, you got born again and you're saved. In whom also after you believe, this is following having been born again, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Notice, the Holy Spirit's a promise. 
You don't get the promises until you are in relationship with him, in covenant relationship, as a born-again child of God. What else is the Holy Spirit? It's the first earnest or first fruit or like the deposit money of our inheritance. It's part of our inheritance. So the Holy Spirit is a promise and it's the first fruit of our inheritance that we receive. That's why when you get someone born again, immediately take them into receiving the Holy Spirit. It's the first thing that you should be ministered to them immediately. Don't just pray for them to get born again and leave them that way. Then you talk to them about receiving the Holy Spirit and take them into receiving the Holy Spirit immediately. There's also something else we see. See, Jesus came to make everything new. And that is now we have new tongues. We have a new way of speaking in the Spirit, speaking a spiritual prayer language from the Holy Spirit within us. Mark 16, 17. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. New is kainos, which means brand new. New tongues. It's come forth in the New Testament era for the body of Christ, now the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have a new prayer language, spiritual prayer language that comes out of the inside of us. And now this is a prayer language. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the mind. It says understanding, but it means mind also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Two ways you can pray, two ways you can sing. God wants you to do both. What is, what is this praying with the Spirit? Verse 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, this is this new tongues, my spirit prayeth, but my mind is unfruitful. So praying in tongues, this new tongues, is praying with your spirit. God wants everybody to receive the Holy Spirit once they're born again, and he wants everybody to have their prayer language. If you don't have your prayer language, God wants you to have that in operation. You've already got the tongues when you, got, when you received the Holy Spirit. Helped a man yesterday who had received the Holy Spirit but had never gotten his prayer language in operation. Helped him at the end of the deliverance time to get his prayer language. He spoke in tongues. He had to know the fact that he had the prayer language and he was able to speak in tongues at will and that he just had to open his mouth and speak. And he did, and he did. Praying in tongues now. Everybody can pray in tongues. Why are not all Christians who have received the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues? It is absolutely important. Verse 2. He that speaks in unknown tongues speaks not unto men but unto God. Well, that's a good thing. It's a prayer language from the, through the Holy Spirit. Language up to God. No man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. Some people say, well, why would I want to speak something I don't understand? Because you're speaking to God, not to men. And you're speaking in the Spirit. Mysteries are divine secrets, things you don't know. And you're allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through you, to pray things that he wants to pray, that he knows need to be prayed for, that you don't know. Instead of bringing God down to our level of knowledge when we pray, let's release him at his level of knowledge, which is everything. That's the tremendous power uh, of what's available of praying in tongues. And it has a dual effect. Verse 4, and he that speaks an unknown tongue also edifies, builds up, and strengthens himself. We have new tongues. God wants you to have your prayer language in tongues in operation. He wants you to get it in operation if you've never spoken tongues. He wants you to be using your prayer language. It will bring a spiritual edification. It will pray for things that you don't know what all to pray for as you ought. And it's what we must be doing. In fact, people say, well, must I pray in tongues? The answer is yes. Why would I say that? Because the scripture says that. Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. This means weaknesses. Speaking of weaknesses of mind in the context. For we know not what we should pray for it in our mind. We know not. That's why it's talking about weaknesses of mind. We know not what we should pray for as we must, as is necessary. The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, which is inarticulate speech or not regular speech, not expressed in our normal language or words. It's a spiritual language that's coming forth. 
spiritual prayer language. It could be uh, other t earthly tongues you don't know, or it could be angelic tongues. This is as we must. We must pray with our spirit, and we must pray with our own mind in line with the Word of God. A new, new tongues and a new way, new expectation of how you're to pray. If you don't pray in tongues, are you praying as you must? No. You, you're limited to what you know, which is <laughs> hardly anything compared to God. That's why we need to be praying in these ways. The New Testament has brought everything new. Jesus brought everything new. We see in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. He brought a new priesthood into being. The Old Testament priesthood was Levitical priesthood. One tribe, the tribe of Levi, he had to be born into it physically. And it was after the order of Aaron. Hebrews 7.11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? What was, what was the reason? There would be no reason. But perfection couldn't come by that. There had to be a brand new priesthood. And there had to be another, well, also, a new priest, uh, high priest. <coughs> the priesthood be it changed, which we see, there's made of necessity a change also of the law. Verse 14, it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. If he was of the tribe of Judah, could he become a priest? Not in the Old Testament. It was only for the Levites, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Yet it's far more evident that after, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest. Why was it important to change this priesthood? Well, not only so Jesus could become a priest, but also because of what the order of Melchizedek was all about. Hebrews 7, 1, For this Melchizedek was a king of Salem and a priest of the Most High God. He was both. In the Old Testament, they were just a priest. Or somebody was a king, but you couldn't be both. In the New Testament, we are now kings and priests unto God. Revelation 1.6 makes it clear what Jesus has done for us. He's made everything new. And now he's made us kings and priests unto God. Not just one tribe, not just certain people that are anointed to be a king. We're all kings. We're all priests unto God. We all can rule and reign, and we all can have free access to the presence of God and function in the New Testament priesthood. As we also mentioned, there is a new law that has come. So many do not understand this in the body of Christ. They talk about grace and they think that they have no responsibilities of law. They put everything on God and they say it's, it's God. Grace, however God wants to bring it, whenever He wants to do it, however He wants to do it. They fail to understand that there's a change of the law, not a doing away of it. A change what law is there now? This law, he made everything new, remember. This law is the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's a brand new law. And this law makes you free from the other law that just brought the knowledge of sin and could do nothing to produce life. It brought condemnation, see? Romans chapter 8 verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that's the law now that operates, has made me free from the law of sin and death. We walk after the New Testament law, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And what will this law produce? The Old Testament law, remember what it produced? <laughs> it just brought the knowledge of sin. What's the New Testament law do? The New Testament law brings liberty. James 1.25, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. The New Testament is a law of liberty that will bring freedom and liberty and victory in your life. And that's what he wants for every one of us. That's why it's a necessity that you are speaking and doing the New Testament law. James 2.12, So speak ye. He's telling you to speak. And when he tells you to speak, this isn't a nice little suggestion. 
He is present tense, continuous repeated action. He's commanding you in the imperative mood. Speak continuously. And do continuously. Same thing, present imperative, command. As they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. God wants you to speak according to New Testament law. He wants you to do New Testament law. That will produce liberty in your life because you will be judged by this law of liberty. Of whether you've done it and come into the liberty that is available for you. God just didn't make a law of liberty and you not to enter into it. We're to be free. We're to enter into the free. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. We now can enter into total liberty in our life. Why would you follow the Old Testament law? Why do Christians follow the Old Testament law? The whole denominations and groups. I talk with a woman this week and I, do, I talk to them all the time who was steeped in following all the Old Testament laws and goes to one of these kind of churches that teaches all this stuff and, and it just teaches the Torah and all these things. I said, why are you doing that? I said, don't you know there's a change of the law? She didn't know anything about that. Hebrews 7, 12. We're not under this. And what is this law? It's a law of liberty now. Do we walk after the Old Testament? No. Everything is new. They had a hard time with Jesus. They had a hard time in the New Testament. When Paul was bringing it forth, Stephen was bringing it forth, they stoned him over it. Paul was bringing forth the truth. They, they were after him. They wouldn't want to let go of the old and come into the new. You know, we have to be ready to let go of the old and come into the new and walk in the new way of the Lord. Let go of all the old things in our life and come into the new way of living, the way of the Spirit. There's a new commandment. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I've loved you, that you also love one another. You love them unconditionally, without reservation. You see everybody as valuable and precious and of great worth. That's the way you operate towards everybody. No more what they did in the Old Testament, which was wrong. From the New Testament standpoint, people that do this are wrong. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus told this brand new change, You've heard it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. Love the person who's nice to you, you know, and, but the guy that's not nice to you, hate him. No, we don't do that anymore. I say unto you, love your enemies. That means love everybody. God wants us to love everybody. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those that spitefully use you. We've come into the new law, the commandments that he's given us, which is a higher law. It's a higher law that he's brought us into. We don't walk after these old ways any longer. The Old Testament was a bunch of do-nots. The New Testament now is after the heart. It's now after your motivation. And so you walk unconditionally without reservation in the ways of the word, regardless of how people treat you or act. It doesn't have anything to do with it whatsoever. In Mark chapter 1, we also have new doctrine. Mark 1, 27. They were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth the, even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. This is just one aspect of the new doctrine. We can command demons to come out of people. They couldn't do that in the Old Testament because they weren't in a position to do that. They didn't have authority in what you get in Christ. Now, we can command the demons to come out. Isn't it amazing that 90 plus percent of the church has never come to still understand this? They don't cast out demons. They're running after the old ways instead of doing what God says. They're not using the authority that's been given to them and they're to cast out the demons. They stumbled over this in the book of Acts still, just like they do today, over all the changes. Acts chapter 17, verse 19, they took him and brought him unto this Areopagus and said, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. What's this new thing? The New Testament is a new doctrine. It is a new way of living. It is the doctrine of Christ. That means you can't follow any other way but the commandments of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6, 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, that we're supposed to be established in it. And as we have that established, then we go on to perfection, having the foundation already laid 
in all these different areas of our life. It's absolutely essential that we walk after the new doctrine. And doctrine is extremely important because look what it says in 1 Timothy 4, 16. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Not just to yourself, but to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save yourself and them that hear thee. That means that's tied into you, your salvation. In doing Continually doing what the Word says, present tense, ongoing action, and doing this, you're going to save yourself. Shall save yourself. It means it has a future effect upon your life. If you're taking heed to yourself and doing, continuing in the doctrine. And also those that are hearing you. If they'll hear you and they'll hearken to it as well. In fact, this new doctrine is absolutely essential. And we must walk after it. You can't compromise it or you're in trouble. Look what it says in 2 John 1, 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. If he's sinning, he's not abiding in this doctrine. He is not having God. Hath not God could be more literally translated because it's a present tense, meaning ongoing action, means he is not having God. He's not having God in his life. He might be going through the motions, but he's not having God. A lot of Christians are not having God because they're transgressing and they're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. He that abideth, that means remaining, continuing in this. That's what he expects. Ongoing action, present tense. In the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. Means if you don't, if you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, do you have both the Father and the Son? No. Everybody assumes they have the Father and the Son just because they, they got born again. No, that was the doorway into relationship with God. It all shows by you abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Because what are we to do? Oh, we got to eat some new food, new bread, new bread from heaven. In the Old Testament, what was it? They were eating the manna that came. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Was that bread from heaven? Jesus said, said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. You thought it was, but that wasn't the bread from heaven. But my Father giveth you the true, the real bread from heaven. What's the true bread from heaven? For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world, Jesus. It starts with you getting the new spirit of Jesus Christ and it continues through Jesus, the word coming into you as you hear the word and you do the word. God wants you to be eating the new bread. Man does not live by bread alone, physical food, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now we live by that. It's also new where the word's written. In the Old Testament, where was it written? 2 Corinthians 3.3 3. For as much as your manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but of the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. It's not written in stone like it was in the Old Testament now. There's groups out there that carry around scrolls and things with the Word of God and think they're doing a great thing. <laughs> ridiculous. Where is the word to be carried in you, in your heart, and in your mind? This is a new day. Why would we go and do such things? These are people that are totally deceived. They have not understood the new day that we are in, the new covenant. Hebrews 8.10, this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. God's Word now gets written in our heart, in our mind. It's inscribed within you, on the inside of you, a new place where things are written. We also see all the things of the Old Testament now. Those simply serve as types and shadows pointing towards the spiritual realities. The Old Testament was made for man after the flesh with all of its fleshly means. 
The New Testament's made for man after the Spirit, while all the spiritual realities and applications. Hebrews 8, 5. <coughs> Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things. All the things he did in the Old Testament were a shadow pointing towards the heavenly things, the real things. When he was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, he had to make things according to the pattern showed him in the mount. He was doing that from what, the, what was the real in heaven. Hebrews 10.1, the law having a shadow of good things to come. It never produced it. It was pointing towards the new things that were coming, not the very image of the things. That's why could never with their sacrifices they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. It could do nothing, no such thing. All it could do, the word brought a knowledge of sin and the sacrifice would just be a, a covering over that would never get rid of sin whatsoever till Jesus come. For then, if it would have got rid of sin, they should have ceased to have been offered because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. They didn't. They had a continual conscience of sins in the Old Testament era. We also see these types and shadows. People that keep days, observing days, observing things. What a mistake. There's whole groups of Christians that are doing this and go going in that direction today. They're in tremendous error. It says in Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, in what you eat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, we're supposed to observe all these days. Do we observe all these feast days? No, we don't observe any of them. What are we doing? In their seasons, we're teaching the spiritual realities of their fulfillment by Jesus Christ, not observing them, because we don't observe those things in, anymore. Of the new moon? No. Or of the Sabbaths? Plural, Sabbath. Day's not there, it really is plural. Sabbath, as Young's brings out in the Greek. Do we keep Sabbaths? No, there isn't a Sabbath anymore because the Sabbath is all pointing towards what Jesus was bringing forth, which is what? Rest. Sabbath means rest. Jesus is our rest. These are a shadow of the things to come or of the coming things. They were pointing towards the coming things, all these things in the Old Testament and the body of Christ. Not is. Is is not there to italicize the body of Christ. Showing that all these Old Testament things are all types and shadows of spiritual realities. Without understanding that, people will never get anywhere in understanding what they need to be doing. Types and shadows are so important. They praise God. We're now in the spiritual realities. There's also a new spiritual family. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 47, look what Jesus says. Then one said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. He answered and said unto him, who told, that told him, Who's my mother and who my brethren? Well, that, you might think in the natural, seemed like a, why in the world would someone say, Who's my mother and who's my brethren? Obviously, I would know in the physical who they are. But he's saying, these guys aren't your family. He stretched forth his hand toward his disciples. Behold, my mother and my brethren. So who's your family? Your spiritual family. The ones who are disciples are your mother and brethren now. It's amazing Christians have not come to this reality and they'll do anything for their physical family and compromise the word across the board in so many ways instead of realizing they're now in the spiritual family and they're to walk in line with the Word of God. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, sister, and mother. Who's my brother, sister, and mother? Only those that do the will of God. Who's your brother, sister, and mother and your family? Only those that do the will of God. That doesn't go over with a lot of Christians because they're still living in the natural instead of living according to the Word of God. There's a new day. We have a new spiritual family. We should be, does that mean we ignore our natural family? No, we preach the gospel to them. But we're not going to compromise for them and do anything contrary to the word in relation to them. If so, we're a compromiser. We can't be doing that. For instance, can you eat with the fornicators, the Bible says? No. 
well, my brother, my sister, or this or that, or they're a fornicator. But they're my physical family. Jesus said, you don't have anything to do with those. You preach the gospel to them, but that's not who you're going to have fellowship with because you're going to get a transfer of spirits coming into you when you do that. Many Christians compromise this continually, making great mistakes. No wonder they get transfer of spirits. No wonder God's not manifested himself in their life. You get contaminated. We can't be getting contaminated. We're to be walking holy. We're to be walking separate from anything. We cannot, we have to set the boundaries and touch not the unclean thing. Mark chapter 4, verse 15. There's also a new way, approach to the word. The word in the Old Testament was a bunch of do nots. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this, don't do this. Make sure you don't get in a mess. And they, they were good at keeping the Old Testament laws and all the do nots. Well, the New Testament now is a different day, it's now bringing forth fruit getting cleansed and bringing forth more fruit and coming to the place of having much fruit, abiding. Mark chapter 4, verse 15, the parable of the sower. These are they by the wayside where the word sown. When they've heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. This is also the new revelation of who's your real enemy. They didn't understand about Satan in the Old Testament. Now we understand who's the enemy. The devil is the enemy. And we understand what he's doing. He's going to try to take that word out of your heart. It gets written in your heart. These are likewise the sown on stony ground. When they've heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves because they weren't doers of it. That's how you get the foundation laid. So endure but for a time, but afterwards when some pressure comes, that's affliction, they get pressed. Or persecution arises for the word's sake. Someone just comes at them for the word. Immediately they're offended. They stumble, they stand aside, they draw back from walking after it. These are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Otherwise, the battle is over the word now in the New Testament in you. What happens? The cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it or the word becomes unfruitful. The cares, the anxieties of the world. You can't, and it really means of this age. You can't let the cares, worries, anxieties of this age get upon you. It chokes the word, and you and the word is unfruitful. No fruit. Just because you know things doesn't mean you have fruit. Fruit is shown by the manifestation of it working in your life and producing results. The deceitfulness of riches, looking after things. The lusts of other things entering in, strong desire, it means flesh running you. Because the strong desires come from the flesh or else they come from the world. The world's all, all full of strong desires for this or that. Choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Matthew's account, it says he becomes unfruitful. Huh. These are they which are sown on the good ground. The ground is a type of your heart. This is the word coming in your heart, see. Such as hear the word, they receive it, they bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. That's fruit, more fruit, much fruit. We're increasing the New Testament is not holding on. It's fruit, more fruit, much fruit, increasing, abounding, flourishing, growing exceedingly in everything. That's what he's going to do in your life. This is the new day, a new approach to the Word, praise God. Also, there's a new temple. Not some temple, some building. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God. You and I are now the temple of God. If any man defiles the temple of God, that means you can't mess up your temple, your body. Him shall God destroy. That's quite a statement. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. You're to be holy. Remember, we're supposed to present our body as a living sacrifice, holy, our reasonable service unto him. Romans 12, verse 1 says that. It means you're supposed to yield your body to be holy. Beseech your brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, living sacrifice, holy. That's acceptable and well-pleasing to God. That's your reasonable service since you've been bought with a price. Therefore, God wants you to conquer all areas of sin, and you are the new temple. 
And this is what he's doing. In fact, he's doing this corporately in the temple for people that will listen to him. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. He wants you and I to grow up and to be the holy temple of the Lord. Holy before him. In whom you're also builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. He wants to come and make his abode in you. He wants to come and manifest himself in you. And he will. God wants to manifest himself in you. The temple of God. In fact, over in 2 Corinthians, we see where it speaks of the fact that he wants to come and not only dwell in you, he wants to walk in you. 2 Corinthians 6.16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? None. You can't have anything be a source outside of God. That's what an idol is, anything you look to that's a source other than God. You are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them. He didn't come just to dwell in you and sit there. He wants to walk in you as you do what he says. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, as you are now led by the Spirit who comes to manifest himself on the inside of you. There's also, because you're a new temple, and because you've come into the house of God, Jesus the cornerstone, there's a new house to be built. You're to be building something. Not some Old Testament temple building that they had, they were always looking to. Hebrews 3, 4, every house is builded by some man, but he that builds all things is God. God's going to do it, but you do have a part to play. Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? You're his house. If, here's the condition, not automatic, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoice in the hope firm unto the end. And we see this building of God be accomplished in our life. You see, you've become a holy priest, not just to go and pray and get all your blessings and receive all these things. More than that, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And when it says are built up, this also shows what you are doing. Are being built up, present tense, continuous repeated ongoing action. You are being built up. Passive voice means God's doing it as you obey his word, a spiritual house. How is your spiritual house going? Are you building your spiritual house day after day after day? My spiritual house, I'm just out there just doing whatever I want to do. That's what a lot of people are doing these days. <laughs> They're in trouble. You're to be building your spiritual house continually to see God accomplish the things that he purposes. And that's what he wants to bring forth. There's also new spiritual sacrifices. We don't offer up physical sacrifices. Many Christians think, well, we don't do those sacrifices anymore. How about the spiritual sacrifices? Yes, you have, you have spiritual sacrifices now that you minister. We see over in Hebrews chapter 13. This is why God wants you to be a praiser and worshiper of God. Any person who will not praise and worship of God is a denial of the spirit is denying the spiritual sacrifices that they're responsible to bring forth to God. They're in trouble. By him let us therefore offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. This is a spiritual sacrifice. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. God wants you to be a praiser and a worshiper of him. You minister to him, he'll minister back unto you. To do good also, and to communicate or fellowship, this is the word koinonia, fellowship and have association with others, forget not. Because you're not to be an island to yourself and go hide in the corner, you're going to be reaching out to other people and ministering to people and helping them and encouraging them. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So these are sacrifices. A sacrifice is you giving of yourself. And then you're giving of all the of spiritual things out of you. Sharing the word with people, ministering to people, casting out demons, ministering healing, preaching the gospel, sharing the word with them, doing good things, fellowshipping with one another, reaching out to them. That's what God wants. We also see there's a new way of worship. It's not just after however God, however some, somebody wants to do it. No. John 4, 24. The hour cometh now is, and the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. According to the word, the Bible says, lift up your hands. Well, I don't lift up my hands. 
Well, then you're not according to the truth. It says to sing unto the Lord. It says to sing in tongues. Well, I don't sing in tongues. I don't want to do that. Well, you're not according to the truth. You're not in the Spirit. So how can you be in the, operating in the Spirit, worshiping in Spirit and truth, if you won't do what the Word says? I'm just throwing a lot of things out that God wants to bring forth. He wants us to get with a program and walk in His ways and do everything. God's going to do a great work. Just think when you come in line with the Word across the board on everything. He's going to do a great work in you. The Father seeks for such to worship Him. Well, if the Father's looking for someone to worship Him in spirit, and in truth, that's pretty important. God is a spirit. They that worship him must, necessary, to worship him in spirit and truth. That means no other way is acceptable. That means man's way of doing things however they want, it doesn't work. It's no good. It won't be accepted at all. There's also, we now have a free approach to God. You can come boldly and receive the things of God that, are, that you need in your life. Look what it says in Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may lombano, is the word, take hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's favor, that's His grace, His mercy, the love of God in action, is available for any of us. And you and I are to come boldly and take hold of all these things. Otherwise, we don't just sit on the sidelines and kind of de deal with everything in the flesh and try to do everything in our own strength and, and hope that everything will maybe work out. No. Is that living the life of Jesus? No. We come boldly to the throne of grace. We take hold of His mercy. We find grace to help in time of need. God's grace and His mercy is to be abounding. Remember what it says in Peter? In all the beginning of all the, almost all these letters, Grace and peace be unto you. Grace and mercy be unto you. Grace and peace be unto you. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. Every single one of them. Why? Because it's supposed to be happening in all of our lives. The favor of God is to be continually working in your life. And the mercy, you're to take hold of it, which includes healing and deliverance and everything that God wants. And peace, which is His result. He said, Peace I give unto you. Peace I, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He gives his peace. Thou will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. These are all new things, and these are realities that God will bring forth in your life as you do the word. He wants these things established in you and me. We want to see God, see God bring forth everything that he purposes. There's also a new way to pray. Most all Christians out there, including pastors, unfortunately, are not praying in line with the Word of God. John 16, 23 said, Jesus said, In that day, talking about the day of the New Testament, you shall ask me nothing. Jesus said, Don't ask me anything. Why do people pray to Jesus then? That's a direct violation of what he said. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Verily, verily means truly, truly. I mean, he says it twice, emphasizing it. Truly, truly. Hey, pay attention, everybody out there in the body of Christ. I say unto you, whosoever shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. Who do we pray to? The Father. How? In the name of Jesus, coming through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. We don't pray to Jesus. We pray to the Father. Also, how do we pray? Do we ask, request, and petition, as most everybody is doing in the body of Christ? Nope. This is the word ask, which means to ask or request, erateo. You'd think the second word must mean the same thing. Certainly it wouldn't be the same, uh, it'd be the same Greek word, or otherwise they'd translate it differently, trying to show you there's something different being said here. Translators did a poor job. It's not the same word, erateo. It's the word aiteo. What do these words mean? Strong's Concordance shows it forth. This is Strong's Concordance in this Lightning Bible program to produce, that I can produce on the screen for you. 2065 is that first one that we bring up. That's the first word for ask. If you notice it, number 2065, Erateo. When we speak of this particular one, 2065 means a request as a favor. Do we, that's what they did in the Old Testament. 
they were requested of a favor. And Jesus said, you don't even have a request of a favor of me now in the New Testament. No. Then the next one is number 154. And again, just to show you, that's the number 154 here, Iteo. This particular word means a demand of something due. Strictly, a demand of something due. Well, that's a big difference. Do I ask, request, and petition for something to be given to me? Or do I make a demand of what is due me for the release of that to come to me that's already been given to me? It makes a big difference. How do I approach the Father now? Am I going to approach him and ask him to do this? I'm asking him to bless me. I'm asking him to heal me. I'm asking him to provide for me. I'm asking him to do all these things. No. Why? Because he already did all these things for you as far as giving you the promises that already have been given unto you in Christ. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. These are now spiritual blessings that are now belonging to us, that have been given to us in heavenly places, meaning they're in heaven. Because you and I have been born again into this New Testament, which has reserved all these promises reserved for us in heaven. So, what are we doing? If we now, how are we going to approach him? We're going to make a demand of what is due us. What is due us? All the spiritual blessings, all the spiritual promises that belong to us, that have been given to us already. Why is it a demand of something? It is a legal term according to law. A spiritual legal demand is made for the release or the enforcement or the manifestation of something that's already in existence. When an attorney comes before a judge, even in the natural, and a law is already in existence that belongs to you, he makes a demand for that law to be enforced or whatever it is to come to you it's already yours. He's just making sure that it's being enforced. It's the same thing. All the promises of God have already been given to us. You are bringing the laws of God, the spiritual laws of God, or the promises of God, or the blessings of God that have already been given to you, and you are making a demand for a spiritual legal demand for what is due you to come into manifestation in your life. It's like a, prayer is like a legal transaction in the spirit to bring into manifestation what he's already given to you. And hardly anybody understands this. Why not? Because they never looked up the word, I tell you, and found out what it means in Strong's. What a mistake. God wants us to understand that we now make a demand of the Father in my name, and he'll give it you. He says, hitherto, up to this time, this should have given a clue to everybody that there's a big change. Because hitherto means until or up to this time, you have made a demand of what's due you of nothing in my name. Well, that certainly should have shown them something. Hey, this is a new day. Something's new here. Make a demand of what's due you. Same word, I tell you. And this isn't a nice little suggestion. This is a continual thing that's supposed to happen for you. And it's also a command, imperative mood, meaning you and I are commanded to continually make demands of what's due us by praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. How do we make a demand of what's due us? Bring the spiritual promise or blessing, speaking the word that belongs to us before him. Your word says such and such. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says such and such. What am I doing? I'm presenting spiritual blessing that's been given to me, the spiritual promise that's mine, and I'm bringing this before him, saying, I, this is mine, I realize this is mine, this is what the word says. By whose stripes you were healed is a spiritual blessing. It belongs to you. It's been given to you. Healing belongs to you because of what Jesus has done. But then what else do we do? Does that mean that if I just quote the word that it's automatically then going to come to pass? No. Quoting the spiritual law is bringing, into, bringing 
forth before the Father what belongs to you spiritually as the promise of God or the blessing has been given to you so that now you can do something else, which is what? Take it into being. Take hold of it and bring it into being. That's why the next part says, and you shall lambano it, which means take hold of it. You make a demand of what's due you and you shall take hold of it. And notice what's going to happen, that your joy may be full. Why would my joy be full? Because I'm going to see all these prayers, all these promises coming to pass. Blessing, 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 promise, promise, promise. Hey, I'm happy. I'm excited. My joy's full. I'm seeing tremendous things happen in my life. I'm getting healed. I'm getting delivered, provided for. The angels protect me. You know, everything. Prospering the work of my hands. I'm blessed coming in and going out. Favor everywhere. Mercy coming my way. These are all these promises that belong to us. Wisdom, understanding, all these things. Doors open that no man can shut. Shut doors that no man can open. Aha, God's doing it. See these things happen one after another, after another, after another, as you speak the word into being. Jobs opening up. I pray the job prayer like we have, scripture after scripture, praying the word to put things in operation. A job. A, oh, I got this job. I got, the, I got all these offers. Now I can pick what I want, and God shows me which one's the right one. When you pray the word, all the promises are yours. You're putting them in operation. You take hold of it. He's going in operation to perform it, and he will bring it to pass. That your joy may be full. A new way of praying. Now we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We make a demand to what's due us, and we take hold of that and speak it into being. And we pray continuously until we see the results to see these things come into manifestation. We also have a new mindset after the Spirit. If your mind is not set after the things of the Spirit, your mind isn't in the right direction. Romans 8, 5. They that are after the flesh, thinking about what I feel, what I think, without considering what the Word says. See, that's a mind after the flesh. Word? I'm not thinking about the Word. I'm thinking about all these things that I want, and what I feel, what I'd like to do. That's a fleshly mindset. You'll mind the things of the flesh because that's where your focus is. But they that are after the Spirit, what the Word says, mining, uh, that, those are the ones that are, that are mining the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, fleshly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded, that's word world minded, produces life and peace. Where's your mindset? My mindset, your mindset, all of our mindsets has to be on the realm of the Spirit. If you're not after the things of the Spirit, then you have a carnal mind that's producing death. But if we have a spiritual mind thinking what the Word says, it's going to produce life and peace. So if you get your mind set properly, and you think on the Word, and you're learning how to pray accurately, you also have to realize you got a new spirit of faith. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. They were just trying to trust the best they could, hoping that maybe God would do things for them. It's a new day. Now you have the same spirit of faith as everybody else has. It's the faith of Jesus Christ, and it's a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we have in the same spirit of faith. That means your faith will do the same thing as my faith or anybody's faith on the face of the earth. On the face of the earth. Well, I heard someone whose faith caused them to get healed. Your faith will cause you to get healed. It'll cause you to get delivered. It'll cause you to get blessed. Your faith will cause the promises to come to pass. It'll move every mountain. It'll conquer everything in your life. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We take hold of everything. Your faith is how you live and how you conquer everything in life as you put it in operation. You have a spirit of faith. How do I get it in operation? I believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Believe the word, speak it into being. Because your mouth is a releaser. It's going to release things that come into manifestation in the realm of the spirit. What have you been speaking? Well, I've been speaking all my problems. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> well, you know, I've got to talk about something. I see all these problems I have. 
Is that going to change them? No. That's just going to keep them alive in front of you. Problem, 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 problem. How about speaking something that will bring a change? Start speaking the promises of God, speaking what God is doing for you. Remember, we talked about whatever you say God's doing for you is what he's, got, what he's doing for you. If you're not saying he's doing something for you, he's doing nothing because you're not releasing him. You believe the word, you speak it into being. Mountain in the way, I command you to be removed in the name of Jesus. Devil's causing me problems. You spirit, I command you to come out of me in the name of Jesus. I need healing. Heavenly Father, I come boldly to the throne of grace. Your word declares Jesus took our infirmities, bore our sicknesses, by his stripes I was healed. You're the healer of all disease. I have a covenant with you. I come boldly, I take hold of your healing power. I thank you, your healing power is flowing in my body right now. In the name of Jesus. And you keep speaking it into being. I need the angels to be doing something. Heavenly Father, I come boldly to the throne of grace just as the Father could pray for the angels to come and to deliver him from this situation. I thank you for sending the angels to come on the scene and deliver me from this. Because I meet all the conditions, I know the angels have, are, are hearkening diligent, the voice of the Lord, and they are, they're, the angels are keeping me in all of my ways. Because you meet the conditions and you speak all these things into being. You've got a spirit of faith. And that's what you live by. And your faith will grow exceedingly. God wants you full of power, full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. That's how they did tremendous things in the book of Acts. That's how they'll do tremendous things in your life. Stephen did tremendous things. He was full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of power, full of all these things, full of faith, full of wisdom. That's what he wants. It's a new day. Everything that Jesus has done, he has brought everything brand new into manifestation. And you've got to know, you've got to walk after the new. Revelation 21, verse 5. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. All things are new. We're going to walk in the new. Don't walk in the old anymore. Don't give place to the flesh anymore. Don't walk after the world anymore. You want to walk after all that's new. And where is it new? It's all new in the Spirit through everything that Jesus is doing in your life, everything that it says, all the promises, all the blessings. He wants all things, these new things, to come into manifestation in your life. Everything that He has for you. We should be busy every day getting the knowledge of God, speaking forth the Word of God, praising and worshiping Him, praying in tongues, offering up a sacrifice of praise, all these things, one after another after another that we've talked about, just seeing them all manifest in our life, M making sure we have a mindset after the Spirit, all the new things, everything that He says, praying to the Father, never thinking you're a servant or a sinner any longer, you're a servant of righteousness, just doing the word of righteousness, praying in tongues, getting this new prayer language in operation, praying in tongues, do it everything that's new. If you will walk after everything that's new in the New Testament, you will see God manifest Himself greatly. You will be blessed. You will be prospered. You'll be healed. You'll be delivered. You'll see fruit, more fruit, much fruit. You'll see enemies be conquered. You'll see God manifest in Himself in your life. You're the temple of God. He'll be, you want, I, want, I want God to manifest Himself in me. Do all these things. He will manifest Himself in you and through you. Because he's not only come to dwell in you, but to walk in you. He wants to walk in you. That's what the mighty church is going to become. The mighty, glorious church will have God so manifested in them. Corporately, in each, every person, individually, but corporately in their midst, it's going to be powerful. And that's why you and I have to get busy doing all these things. Building your spiritual house. Don't build things that are no good. Paul said, are you building the things that you once got rid of? What are you doing? <laughs> Don't build those things again. Stay away from them. Build the new things. Build everything that God wants in your, house, in your life. Let God have his way. Do everything he says. Every new thing is coming into manifestation in your life. So he makes everything new. And you will see all these great blessings come to pass for you. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the New Testament, 
that Jesus brought into being. I thank you. He's made all things new. I am going to walk according to the new in the spirit, according to the word of God. And I am going to see all these new things come into manifestation in my life. I refuse to walk after the old. I will not go backwards. I am going forwards. I am walking after the law of liberty. And I will see freedom and liberty in my life. I thank you as I am a hearer and a doer of your word. In walking in all these new ways, I will see all your promises, all your blessings come into manifestation in my life. I will pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. I will make a demand to what's due me by bringing the scripture promises that have been already given to me. I will take hold of them and speak them into being and I will continue to pray until I see them manifest and I thank you that you will perform your promises in every area of my life. And as I see these promises coming to pass, my joy will be full. Thank you, Lord, for manifesting the blessings of the new covenant in my life as I am a hearer and a doer of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Everything is new. Make sure you're focused on the new. Don't let yourself ever go back backwards or look at the old ever again. Praise God. Father, we thank you and praise you for helping everybody to come to this truth. And if anybody has gone after the things of the old, thank you for them coming to a real repentance right now that they would turn away from walking after these all these old things and fleshly things and, and things of the Old Testament and come to the place of doing things according to the New Testament way in line with the Word to see you bring forth everything that you purpose. Thank you. There'll be much fruit because we are hearers and doers of this Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.